Welcome to the Landscape Photography Vlogcast, hosted by myself, Tom Peters, aka the Photo Ninja, all right north, Paul Thompson Photography, and it's truth mate, it's Matt Bishop. We cover all things photography and chat to some of the best photography minds in the business. Put your feet up, the kettle on, and let's jump straight into this week's vlogcast. Right, welcome to the podcast, everyone. And uh, this week we're talking with Matt Jackish. Uh, how you doing, mate? All right? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Yeah, uh, well done on the name. You pronounced it perfectly. Did I? Oh, I thought I did. Yeah, I was a bit worried about it. <laughs> I was a bit worried about it. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so how's things been with you in, over there when uh, you were living in Canada, yeah? Yeah, I'm here in Vancouver. Uh, you know, with regards to COVID, I think we're all sort of on the upswing now. I think things are, you know, looking a little rosier. Uh, we just, you know, passed our third wave and, uh, you know, things were looking pretty negative there for a while. Um, mm. So you kind of get this sort of general mood of the society and, and uh, you know, things were pretty down for a few weeks and, and I think we're getting out of that. So uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel, I hope. We'll see. Mm. I don't know if I'll be getting on a plane anytime soon, like you guys, but um, <laughs> we'll see about it. Yeah. Oh, ideal. So for people who maybe don't know you, um, I don't know why that would be, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, do you want to give give us give us like a brief brief overview of um, you as a photographer and oh, where man. it all began? Really, I know it's a bit of a broad question. <laughs> oh, big dolly! Um, right back to the beginning, mate. Right back to the beginning when you picked up a camera. You know, when I left the womb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I started traveling and sort of adventuring a little bit. Uh, before I really got into photography. Um, I always had a camera with me. Uh, I started backpacking back in 2010. I did a solo trip, uh, sort of around Asia and Costa Rica. And, uh, you know, just with the camera, just with a little point and shoot, uh, I just realized, uh, you know, I, I never felt like lonely or, or out, of, of, out of sorts. I was just always going after this shot or that shot. So I just realized I had a passion for it and uh, it just slowly sort of, you know, grew from there. And uh, it was just sort of one year to the next. It just got more, you know, I just sort of kept going deeper into this rabbit hole of photography. Mm. And as you yeah. know, it just, it just doesn't end. It's just, there's <laughs> always more to learn. There's more to see, there's more to explore. There's, there's more people to learn from and there's more people to be inspired from. And it, it's, it's been quite a journey. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's really a good answer to your question. Uh, you know, I, I'm still working. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm technically an amateur, I guess you could say. Um, you know, I just sort of do it when I have time. Um, I do have a lot of time. So, uh, you know, it's become a bit of a, an obsession. It's probably not very healthy, but you know, I just love it. I just, I just love it. And I, I'm going to keep going with it. Why yeah, do you it's say it's not healthy? Well, <laughs> it's, it's become, uh, it's become something that I almost have to do, right? Like it's, it's, uh, I feel almost yeah. out of sorts when I'm not doing it. It's, mm. it, it's, it's just calling to me and, and, um, you know, I'm living life from one composition to the next, it feels like. So, mm. uh, you know, when I haven't done it for a week or two, I, I get this uh, angsty feeling like I'm, like I'm wasting my time. And, yeah. um, and yeah. you know, I, you, you always question about, you know, the path about whether, you know, this is really the, the right thing to be doing, whether, you know, I'm really contributing anything. Uh, you, you go through those questions about, you know, what value does this have? I mean, I'm not, I'm not really generating much of an income from this. So it's just sort of for my own jollies, my own curiosity. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, you, you get all these sort of signals that um, make you question whether this is really, you know, practical, but hmm. does, it, does it need to be, I guess, you know, like, uh, yeah. Yes. As long as you're getting something out of it, it doesn't really matter, does it? I think that's that's the key to it. Well, yeah, and I am. I mean, I, I just love it. Uh, there's there's just 
so much that I still want to contribute to this thing that I still want to explore and, and see and try and make. And, and, and it's a passion. And it's so, and I'm sure it's the same with you guys. It's just sort of something that keeps you going. That, yeah. That keeps you kind of, keeps that sense of wonder alive and, and yeah, it just keeps you sort of engaged, you know? Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So when did you realize that maybe you were, you could, uh, there was something here to build off. When did you realize that you was um, starting to take some really, really decent images? Did you, was there a point when you thought maybe there was some sort of, there was legs in this, in what you was doing? Uh, the, the, uh, there were always these little micro catalysts that sort of told me like, Oh, wait a minute. Like maybe there is something to this. Um, I, I remember, uh, signing up for, uh, Max Rives tour in Greenland Mm -hmm. and, you know, I showed up a day early. So I showed up for the other participants when I met up with Max and to my surprise, he already knew who I was. He was familiar with the work. Oh, okay. Like, this is yeah. Max Vibe. Like this is this guy's a big deal. You know, why would he know about me? Why would he be you know familiar with my work? So he does his research, mate. He does his research. He, Max he's very well researched. You know, he's watching. Uh, so he is. I was I was quite flattered by that. Um, and, and you know, that's when I realized, oh, maybe I am putting out you know some quality stuff and the, you know stuff that people are are noticing and and, and maybe having an impact. So uh, you know that that was one thing that sort of stands out in my mind is as because it's really hard to gauge, right? Like you get these sort of mixed signals on social media. And I mean, I get a really inconsistent response. So it's really tough to gauge whether, um, you know, your, your work is impactful, I guess, if you know what it is. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I have to yeah. see whether I'm constantly second guessing whether it's, whether my work's good enough. You, you never know. Yeah. That's why, that's why I, I plague Matt and Tom with, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? What do you think you should do with it? <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just sort of an insecurity. You just don't know, do you? It's, it's hard to know. But you're uh, always going to have that insecurity, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, so. I mean, yeah, I, I do too. I used to actually also get people to critique my work before, before sharing. Uh, but then I realized, you know, like, the more outside um, influence I have in my work, the less the less it's maybe me. And you know, just just throw it out there with the flaws and and with whatever I was feeling that day. And and you know, it's almost a little more raw that way, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just I was just going to say, how how do you um obviously you live where you live is is full of amazing landscapes, and you've got woodlands and. What what do you what do you strive for? What, what do you always what's your always what's your go to um, location or subject? Uh, that's very seasonal. Um, mm. So uh, like right now we're getting into the end of May. So right now the forests uh, and the waterfalls are just popping green right now. So yeah. that's going to be the focus for the next uh, little while here. Uh, we still have pockets of old growth here, which are tremendously special places that, you know, haven't been disturbed since the glaciers went through, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're also extremely difficult to photograph, um, yeah. but I really get something out of that. And these places, some of them, they just do not see visitors. There's not trails or anything. So you just kind of got to bushwhack your way in. Um, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, otherwise, mountains. Uh, obviously, are, uh, you can't go wrong with mountains, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so starting in July, I try to get up a little higher. Uh, I go up into the mountainscapes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's never-ending. In British Columbia, you can take 10 lifetimes to really explore this province. Um, you know, there's a lot of the same locations being recycled here because they're quite accessible, but the inaccessible places here far outnumber uh, what's accessible. So, you know, starting to look at more more helicopter trips and stuff like that to drop oh, yeah. drop in. Yeah. Um, winters are becoming uh, a, a real focus for me as well. Uh, you know, the stuff out there that you can get in winter, I'm getting more comfortable in that terrain. I'm sort of learning mm. the other safety aspects. Uh, how to read the snow and, you know, how to safely go off trail in, in those, you know, climates and stuff. Um, so I'm starting to unlock that, that landscape as well. 
um, it's, it's difficult, but it's a lot of fun as well. And there's, there's some gems to be had out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I was just, um, talking uh, a little bit earlier before before we went live about your, uh, your Pano Epson Pano image. Oh yeah. 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 It's a stunning image, mate. It, it, you know, it's funny, like while I was there, uh, taking a picture of that tree, like I would have never imagined in a million years that that was going to be the Pano award winner, but it was just something different. It just had these <clears throat> great textures. Uh, it just caught my eye. It was a real long line shot. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it was, I, I submitted that photo because I figured it's so different from anything I'd ever seen before that it's either going to, you know, get tossed or it might be quite well. <laughs> Who knows? You mm. just never know. Well, I think it yeah. did all right, mate. I think you were all right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got in the top 100, so that's pretty good. Yeah. For people who don't know who are listening, uh, Matt Jackish this year won <laughs> the uh, Epson Panel Awards. So, um I suggest that you get up on um, on yeah, the internet and, uh, and have a look at the awards and you can check out that image, which I'm probably sure we'll, we'll bring up, won't we, Paul, on YouTube? So yeah, we'll can, put the links down below. Yeah, and um, so you can actually appreciate that image. It's a beautiful image. It, it does remind me a lot of – did you find any inspiration from other photographers from this image or – um. I'm trying to think. I mean, the one shot that maybe stands out in my mind a little bit is is the Mark Adams shot of, of uh, you know, this lone tree in the center and there's sort of mm. these mounds of snow that are obviously large boulders that are covered. And, and it just had this sort of symmetry and simplicity to it that, that might have been been in the back of my head somewhere when I was shooting. Okay. Mm. Um, maybe a bit of work by Alex Noriega. Yeah, actually, Alex yeah. as well uh, has some great snowy tree shots, and, and they were probably mm. back in there somewhere, right? Just in the subconscious. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Taking yeah. so many photos, sometimes it's hard to actually recollect what the inspirations were. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's important to have that conversation with yourself because some people actually, I, I, I find they don't really. There's a bit of a disconnect there between what you know what created that shot. So yeah, that's a good mm. question. Because um, yeah. I look at that image and I, I, it, it does remind me a lot I, of, you know, an inspiration from, from Alex Noriega's uh, work with these, you know, with this, type of, with this type of landscape. But there is a lot of your work in it. It's obviously you haven't gone and copied something that he's done. You mm. can see it as yours. It's very distinctively yours. It's, yeah, uh, it's quieter. Uh, it's softer. Um, the composition is very, very simple. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful image, mate. And I can see why they chose that. It's, um, definitely, um, definitely, definitely a great shot. And uh, people who don't know of you, I suggest they go out and, and have a look on the internet. Um, you're pretty much everywhere now, aren't you? Facebook, Instagram. Um, that's really about it. You've got a website. <laughs> yeah. You've got your own website. Yeah. Your website's very well done too. I'd suggest people go and have a look at your website. Oh, thanks, um, I, I admire a lot of your work. I mean, you know that I have for quite a while now we've probably what known each other for quite a bit now. And, um, yeah, I suggest people to go and check out all of your work because it's very inspiring. You've got very dramatic approach about um, capturing these landscapes in your, in local Canada. And, but I think that you, your images come back a little bit quieter. They're not quite as loud mm. as, as some of these other landscapes are out there. So I can really appreciate it for that. Yeah, I'm really trying to strike the balance between this, you know, power as well as subtlety that, Mm -hmm. you know, I I want the light to be real. So, like, the the moments are definitely powerful, but I don't want to, like, you know, blast it in people's faces either. So, Mm -hmm. um, try to walk the tightrope a little bit. It's a big mistake that we make, isn't it? We try and... We try to be as loud as possible to get to get attention on social media <laughs> because that's where the basis of our of our communication is today, isn't it? So uh, yeah, I mean, um, that's where we find our connections really. With I mean, that's what, that's really what this is about. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
once upon a time, your only way of, you know, attracting attention was in a, was in a landscape photography magazine or in a, you know, a big print on a wall somewhere that, um, you know, someone could appreciate your work. So yeah. it's, it's hard to attract that attention. And, um, I think sticking to your style and, being very distinctive about you are who you are and the landscapes that are around you. You've done, you've done a brilliant job of it. Mm. I know that you're not a loud person. Um, you're quite, uh, quite a reserved person and you don't sort of, um, try and sell yourself too much Yeah, uh, as do a lot of other photographers do. So I really appreciate you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's just uh, I'm not really that comfortable doing that. Uh, I, I want to really focus on on the creativity aspect and not so much on on the you know waving my hands up and down. Uh, <laughs> hey, everybody, look over here. I, mm, I just, yeah, uh, it's not, not really my style. I think a lot of creatives, you know, introspective types are not really like that. Um, mm-hmm. I remember reading. Uh, I read a, an article from Guy Tal about. Uh, you know the introverts uh in this in this genre you know how they should really avoid playing the extroverts game like just stick to your style stick to you know be true to yourself and mm. uh, you know don't try to play their game just just do do you and 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 focus on that and just be real and and you'll find your audience and it's yeah. a great article yeah I, i'd have to dig it up now but uh it yeah. resonated with me so no, he's digging for a true. while, mate. Guy Tell's written a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he's written a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is so true, actually. Because I must admit, I, I recently went out and took some, um, got some decent shots of the bluebells here, and uh, it, I tried the same approach when I take. I try and edit them to be subtle and real and and all that. And it's so hard when you're in Photoshop not not to get carried away because. You see so many pictures, don't you, on Instagram that are technically horrendous, but they're yeah. bright orange and green, and and you know they've got hundreds of thousands of likes, and you just think, oh. But so yeah, but yeah, you are true. I think what you your images are very true to you, and and they're subtle, and yeah, and, and they're obviously uh, gaining traction. So no, yeah, good job. It's- it, it, it is really easy to get carried away even when you're not like comparing to other work you just sort of without realizing it you just go a little too far with it and it's just a little too punchy and contrasty and and he, it's hard to do that without referencing other work yeah like i take a lot of breaks when i'm when i'm editing just just so i can you know recalibrate my eyeballs and get yeah. away it's um, important yeah, yeah definitely yeah important. Yeah. So, cause you, you sort of, you, you lose perspective and becomes, you know, you, you just, you don't see the, the color casts and the, the contrast and stuff. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely get locked into this sort of thing of got to churn out more content, got to churn out more content. You've got to kind of give yourself a bit of slack and give you t- time to yeah. adjust really. Yeah. I really, I really hate having to, you know, think about catering to an algorithm or, yeah. or a style of, of um, creativity that is more recognized than another. I really don't like that stuff. So, so I'm really trying to be true to, to my, uh, my views. And I, I just want to keep my work uh, both personal and original. Um, yeah. So, so that's front of mind when I'm out there shooting. I don't, I try not to, well, I, I certainly don't, uh, you know, when I'm out in the field, think about, Oh, this would make a great print or this would make a great sponsored, whatever. Or I, I don't want to think in terms of products. I'm, I'm just strictly out there being curious, uh, and engaging nature basically. And, mm. uh, trying to make sense of, I'm trying to make something look beautiful really and convey it convey a scene convey a story with, with one image yeah so um recently well last podcast we had an enrico on and he was talking about um when he edits his images he sort of he chooses his images depending on how he feels at the time i was just wondering how how do you approach your uh editing as in do you have like a, a back catalogue of images that you th- sort of work through methodically or do you just 
think oh, I fancy editing a a waterfall shot today or yeah it's um i had a major backlog uh, of images uh, up until a few months ago um because i i had done a, a, a trip back in 2017 i just accumulated this massive images that i just didn't have time mm. and it's almost as if uh when you're sitting down and you're sort of starting to decide what you want to do it almost decides for you like it's almost like the image chooses you it's yeah, yeah, it's just like uh, you know, you move a couple of sliders, and you're like, oh wait, there's something here. Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going with it, and you you sort of poke around a little more, and you're like, yeah, there's, this is this is this could be good if I you know if I just exploit the light a little bit here and darken this spot, and, and suddenly you have a really a really great uh, scene to to sort of work with. Um, and isn't it good to go back to some of those old images too? Because if you had a hoed it and done it back then. You probably regret it now because, I mean, I look at your work. I've known you for probably a few years now, um, and I remember originally seeing your work, which was quite as beautiful as it was, very, very heavy, very contrasty. And I can, we've had this conversation before uh, recently that you know your work has transitioned into something that's not as loud, very, um, very subtle and, and, and truer to, to, to the light that you captured. And I think that, do you think that probably over the recent last couple of years that you've gone through that experimental phase of trying everything out in post-processing that you're now refining that experimental phase into a standard of what you understood is your photography. Yes. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Matt. Um, that is happening. Uh, yeah, I'm very mindful about uh, having a direction in, in uh, the way I'm evolving uh, as, a, as an artist. Um, mm. I, I, you know, I'm getting away from things like that, those deep uh, contrasty style of images. I'm getting away from magenta. Um, I'm getting away from... Um, wide open, you know, wide angle shots. Uh, and I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm exploring different avenues of this, uh, for sure. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I used to also edit in a really dark room, uh, with a pretty bright screen. And so you just end up with dark images. Uh, mm. so I back away from that. I edit in a brighter room now and, and I've darkened my monitor a little bit, uh, just to, you know, give it a little more balance. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to get away from uh, my creativity or, or my art becoming a habit and always doing the same thing. Um, yeah. You know, photography for me is a way of breaking habit. So I want it to have a direction. I want it to be in a, in a state of constant sort of evolution where it is an experimental process and I am trying things that I haven't tried before, taking risks, um, mm. you know, even putting things out there that may or may not, you know, really connect with an audience just, just to see, you know, you know, what do people think of this? Uh, I haven't seen it done before. I mean, I'm going to see if it connects or not. Um, yeah. and it doesn't always, sometimes it just flops and that's fine. Like whatever. Mm. As I say, how, how do you, how do you take the, um, not, not that you have had many hits, but how do you, how do you take them hits? Do you, do you take it very personal or like the, the feedback you get from social media or I mean I've been very lucky actually I haven't really come across really many haters which makes me think that I haven't really I'm not really successful yet oh you haven't made it yet mate (laughs) 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 we were talking about that recently weren't we guys yeah Yeah. when you when you start getting hate mail and comments that's when you know you you're you're getting somewhere yeah yeah that's when you know you're staring the shit yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I certainly feel a greater sense of vulnerability with the writing that I share. I, I don't know, like, I, sometimes I really do a deep dive into the experience and I share, you know, how I was feeling and, and what it was like out there. And mm. I sort of dissolve the identity a little bit. Um, and, and it can it can really feel like it's coming out of left field, I think. Uh and I know there's certainly people reading that who would who it absolutely will not connect with. So yeah, um, there's a degree of like 
coming across as a bit of a, as a bit of a, I don't know, like a, you're just kind of out there, but, but it, to my surprise, it's really land. It's really landed. It's really uh, people. Uh, it really resonates with, and and so that that comes for a lot. I feel like I've really uh, made some good connections that way. Mm. Um, and, and you know, it's really flattering actually that people like it's Instagram where you're just like flicking the uh, flicking by, flicking by. Uh, you know, that the fact that people stop and read my little blurb. That's you know, I don't take that lightly. That's yeah, that's good. Quite an honor. It is. That's yeah, when you know someone's actually taken their time to actually that they're actually appreciating your art, yeah. and yeah, they yeah. They, yeah. they they, they want to look at it rather than okay, let's just scroll through Instagram and just quick put a like on everything just so I can bump up my algorithm and uh, for when I post a photo, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, that happens ninety five percent percent of the time I believe so oh, <laughs> if, if, if when you do get people to actually take the time and you actually see that they've read what you've written is like wow God. yeah on yeah. Instagram <laughs> yeah exactly places, I know yeah it's like the yeah. instant gratification you know benchmark really mm, mm, mm. It's, yeah quick quick fix. It's crazy I think I read somewhere the other day that you um the average you could basically get less than three seconds to grab someone's attention. Um, yeah. The average person doesn't, doesn't even look for three seconds, which is crazy, really. Yeah, it's, it's a sad truth, isn't it? Yeah, all that effort and work for three seconds of attention. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> put it down. Put it down. Put it as black and white as that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was how. That was how long the first podcast I had lasted with with Paul. Yeah, it's because I was sick of you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously, uh, Matt, we got on there and about 15 minutes later, he goes, well, it was great to have you on. And, um, you know, that was the end of it. And I thought, you're kidding me. I said that was like quick sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was all because <laughs> it was all because uh, Tom camera wouldn't work that night <laughs> wasn't it Tom <laughs> so I was uh, kind of put put in a position where I was thinking right I'm gonna have to do this but it, yeah, it, it worked <laughs> all right we, we did a two-parter it worked well yeah, yeah, that, was, well. Uh, that was my yeah. bad and yeah, now, really they're st- now they're stuck with me <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've watched, that one. I, I, I've watched a few of your, your uh, interviews now and yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I wanted to know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> Before signing up, no, I'm not doing this. Yeah. Yeah, because no yeah, I, 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 sent, I sent Matt a message and I, he answered me about uh, 36 hours after. So I think he went, did his research. <laughs> <laughs> Watched every video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I average about 36 to 40 hours to answer people. <laughs> I have to think about what I'm going to say. <laughs> right guys what i'm going to do is have a quick break and we'll be right back if you're watching this then i assume you're someone who is passionate about both photography and the natural world over the last decade i'm sure you've seen the incredible growth in photography everyone has a camera these days and everyone wants a beautiful nature photo to share with the world unfortunately The passion to capture that image often overrides thoughtfulness. Wildflower fields are being trampled and destroyed. Delicate, unknown locations are being widely advertised, bringing crowds of people, transforming wild places into urban spaces. Regulations, private property, and the well-being of wildlife are ignored in the pursuit of an image for Instagram. If such things weigh heavily on you, consider joining Nature First, the movement for responsible nature photography. This is a global initiative to help recover the role of nature photographers as caretakers and ambassadors of the natural world. There are no membership fees, no ads, no gimmicks. It's just an opportunity to be part of this global initiative of nature photographers dedicated to caring for the natural world. You can learn more at naturefirstphotography.org. So we talked a little bit about your process, but how... What what exactly are you shooting with these days? Um, do you want, are you happy to talk a little bit, a little bit about gear? Or uh, yeah, we like gear chats. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm like the opposite of a of a gear guy actually. But I, <laughs> I'm shooting with a Nikon D810, 
And then I've got everything from, you know, the 14 to 24, right up to the 80 to 400 uh, lens. Um, and yeah, that's, that's served me extremely well uh, for the last, oh boy, I think I've had it for five or six years now. Mm. Uh, I came over from Canon, I had the 5D Mark II, and I was waiting and waiting and waiting for them to up their, their sensor game. Uh, yeah. And I'm yep. You know, finally, I just, I just bit the bullet. Mm. And uh, actually, funny story. So, like, I, yeah, I get this camera, it's brand new, and then I join a Mark Adamus tour. Uh, the first tour I've ever done with Mark Adamus and uh, we're out there day one and it's like my first interaction with Mark and I know he's got the same camera and I asked him, mm. hey Mark, like, what does this button do on this D810? Thinking he'll have an answer for me, right? Um, he, he, what he says is, uh, the first thing you need to know about me is that I'm an artist, not a photographer and I have no idea what that <laughs> <laughs> And that was the shutter button. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing is, it was it was the perfect answer because I used to think to be a good photographer, you need to know every function of your camera, every menu, every button. And mm. here, here's Mark Adam is a world class, you know, leading photographer, uh, saying it doesn't matter. You don't need mm. to know what that does. And and that was actually, it, it, I forgave myself of having to know everything about my camera in that moment. It was it was the perfect answer. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought it was great. And You're not going to tell us you shoot in auto mode, are you, mate? Say again? <laughs> You're not going to tell us you shoot in auto. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the basics. I can get through the basics of photography. <laughs> that's all you need. Well, before before digital, mate, that's what it was. You know, you had to understand the basics of a camera and everything else was about um, focal distance, composition, and there wasn't much more about it. So I think if you apply those rules in the digital age, you're going to get by with a beautiful raw image, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you still have to get it right in the field. You, you, you definitely still have to, you know, get the right shutter speed, focus, composition and all that stuff. Um, but mm. all those little gizmos and the menus and, and all these little extra add-ons and stuff like that, um, you know, back in the early days, I really thought you needed to have a real good understanding of all that stuff. And mm. it was daunting, really. It's, it's probably daunting for a lot of people looking to get into it, but you don't need to know that stuff. You know, I had some shutter speed, aperture, you know, maybe white balance, whatever, um, and and go be an artist. That's yeah. That's what it's mm. um, oh, yeah, hundred percent. Oh, I thought that one. Yeah. Sorry, mate. You go. You go, mate. It's fine. What's that? You go. You go. So I didn't want to interrupt you. It's it's okay, mate. You're not deaf. It's just Paul can't. Uh, Tom can't speak English. It's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> 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 Don't make up for you. Be right. You might go, mate. Yeah, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just saying it was a great lesson that I wasn't expecting to receive that way. You know, it was. It was just. Uh, you know, it was like whatever. Who cares what that button does? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I said I like. I I've recently bought a Sony and um. Everyone says to me, "Ah, oh, this menus are horrendous," and and blah blah blah. But oh, I don't think I've been in the menus since the day after I got it, after I set it up. No, um, you just need to set it up, and then you don't need to be back in them. To be honest, never, I don't think. No, mm. you know, I've set all my keys, the short keys around the buttons that I need, and I never even I don't even touch the white balance. Um, I just leave it, leave it on auto all the time, and. I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> you said. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's the beauty of, of capturing in raw, isn't it? Yeah. I, totally. Yeah. Yeah. You've got those five, five rules you need to, 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 you know, make sure, you know, you, as you said, your sharpness, your depth of field, mm -hmm. your composition and your exposure, obviously, because if you stuff that up, well, yeah. nothing much you can do about that Yeah, and go for it. Talk us through basically what you do when you're out on field. Okay, you set up your tripod, you put your camera on, you've got a composition in front of you. How do you take that image? Uh, well, I mean, 
there's two different various states I'm in when I'm, when I'm photographing, uh, you know, I'm either in, you know, kind of a trophy hunting state where I'm going after something I've already found from a previous visit, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe I want to improve on someone else's shot that I've seen there. That's an exception. Uh, what I'm usually doing is, is really exploring, uh, and in a more, more of a creative explorative state. Um, mm -hmm. so the tripod usually comes out last, uh, you know, I'm usually like in, in all these different awkward positions, trying to figure out the best angle, uh, you know, how to cap capture the best, uh, you know, sort of direction of light and, uh, how can I frame it up the best? And that, that can take hours that can take, um, days even, you know, if I'm, if I'm hunkered down in a spot for three days, uh, you know, if your mountain is your obvious subject, but you're trying to figure out a foreground or something to really, really lead into it well, that process is so exhausting and, and it takes such a long time and, and it takes so much patience. And, you know, you can have altitude sickness and haven't slept well in a few days and you're just totally out of it. But the more patience you apply to that process, the better outcome you will get. Um, and so eventually when you find that sort of, perfect shot that mathematically, you know, geometrically perfect angle, uh, you know, that's when the tripod comes out and, you know, then you just kind of sit on a rock and you wait for the light. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a long process for sure. And, and I try to build as much time into that as, as I can. And I, and I try to capitalize on the time that I've allowed to be there as much as I can. Um, that's a good than, point. Mm. Yeah. And rather than focus on getting like three or four nice shots, I try to get that one perfect shot. Mm. Otherwise, I'm not sharing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you're rushing around trying to get 20 different compositions. And it, it's, yeah, yeah, you're wasting yeah, your time at that point. You're spreading yourself a little too thin and, and you're not mentally committed to, to the objective of telling the story in one image. And that's kind of what I try to do. I, I don't really you know, try to bang off a shopping list. I, I just want to really find the best, uh, that I can get. Um, you know, like well, I went to a Cinnaboy last summer and, you, you know, I'd been there before. Everyone's got a great shot of a Cinnaboy and I, I just wanted to try something a little different. And I, I eventually found this cave and crawled in and, and just sort of spent some time in there. And I, you know, we didn't have great conditions, but I got a pretty good shot that I liked of it. Um, but it was, it took a while. Like I had to wait for these clouds to come in, which took hours and hours. And, uh, I don't even know if it happened on the first day. So we had to go all the way back the second day. It was a bit of a hike. Um, mm. but once you find that, that thing that works, stick with it and, and wait for that, the conditions that are conducive to making it great. Yeah, definitely. You, you talked about, um, getting your shot and waiting for the light. Do you, do you tend to look for a composition first or are you, do you try and be certain, what's the word like spontaneous? Do you, do you look for a composition or do you react to the light? Does that happen first sometimes or does it, does it really just depend? It really depends on what the light's doing. Uh, if the light happens to be going off right when I arrive at a great place, then it's full on panic. I mean, you <laughs> know you're getting rewarded before you're ready. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, my strategy tends to be, you know, get the basic shot first, just get a typical, you know, maybe no foreground or just, just get something in your camera. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least you have some great light. And then if the light continues to deliver, you know, then you can try being a little more experiment, experimental. Uh, you can, you can get a little bit more fancy. You can, you can try maybe putting more layers into your shot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I get I, I get a little bit more risky as the time uh, proceeds, and and maybe that pays off, and maybe my first shot is, is the best shot of the day. Yeah. Um, but so I, I start simple, and then I progressively uh, try to make it a little bit more complicated. Mm. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Such a nice feeling, isn't it, when you um when you turn up and it, and it, it is panic mode, but oh. you get a shot you think you think in the back of your mind, you think, yeah, that could be good. And then it's just like, ah, oh. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember I was at this viewpoint in, in Iceland and it was a cloudy day. It was gray. It was very uninteresting. So I was just sort of shooting like long lens into these mountains. 
And then without a warning, the sky just exploded. And I'm like, holy cow, like everywhere. It was just like this vibrant red and pink and all these textures. And I, I mean, I just panicked and I just started floundering and flailing and grabbing like different lenses and stuff like that. <laughs> like, like I lost track of all time. I think I might've lost consciousness. I just, like, <laughs> I don't know I'll what start happened. with the shock. <laughs> it was just like... Uh, yeah, it was full on panic mode, but, uh, you know, I ended up getting a good, a good shot of it that I liked. Uh, it was, it was great. I That's good. I, I work horrible under those conditions. When I mm -hmm. arrive at a location and I get the light then and there. Yeah. It's like that adrenaline actually cuts off my creative part to my brain. You know, that part mm -hmm. where you start searching for a composition, you start thinking about the whole process about, okay, what's this going to look like in post-production afterwards? What am I trying to achieve here? All that for me goes out the window. When I arrive in a location, I've got that light there and then. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like you, like you said, you arrive on a location, you walk around with the camera for a while, you then the tripod is the last thing that comes out. Yeah. Because you've got that planning. So it's good that you yeah. can perform in, in those situations. I'm horrible like that. I really am. I typically find that I get I get my shot, my composition dials about 10 minutes after the peak of the light. So you still have some light, mm. but you miss the best of it when you find your calm. And that yeah. is, oh, come on. <laughs> like that the same way or I don't know. I, I rarely ever get the perfect comp with the perfect light. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, you yeah, time. yeah, I generally find it right after it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Gutting. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just think, oh, it's fine. I'll just come back another day because now I know. And yeah, then that yeah. day, that, that light and that, that situation never is never there when you're there ever again. <laughs> no, no. And then it turns into a trophy hunt and then you're just mm -hmm. chasing the same shot and I, while it sometimes reaps reward, it's, it's pretty rare and it, it's kind of annoying. I find to, you know, you're, you're now you're living out something preconceived, which mm. is not nearly as much fun. Yeah. No, no. So how, when you, how, when do you think, you know, you've got uh, a world beater? When do you think like, obviously like, I know when I take a shot, I think sometimes, yeah, I think it could be good, but do you, do you feel like you, actually know there and then where uh, you've got 50 50 uh like sometimes i'm like right away i'm like boom i got it like mm. you nailed it and other times you know i'll be back in my tent or wherever reviewing the shots and maybe like I, I what i do a lot of is zooming in and cropping in different ways and seeing like oh what if i sort of narrow this one or do a 16 by 9 mm. and then oh there's a shot like it works oh, um, yeah and that was not obvious before um, sometimes, yeah, you just, you just have to crop in a little bit or, so, or, you know, just look at it closer. And, uh, that process actually, I spend quite a long time doing as well. I mean, chances are you're going to have a lot of downtime when, when you're out, like, you know, when I'm mm. out and stuff, there's a lot of downtime. So I, I'm spending a lot of time reviewing the images, uh, and, and sort of moving the screen around and just seeing if I, if there's a picture within the picture that I, that I can really hone in on. Um, yeah. and so, a lot of the time I find one that way. Mm. Um, There's yeah. the advantage of the big advantage of the, um, the big senses these days is it does yeah. give you more the ability to do that's even more evident, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're still using the D810 now or? Still using it. Yeah. Still very okay. happy. With it. It's taken quite a beating. It's gotten soaking wet. I've dropped it uh, and it still works perfectly fine. So uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't need to have the latest and greatest. Uh, you know, I would like to print large one day, hopefully soon, but, um, so maybe some more megapixels, but for now I'm, I'm pretty happy with what I have. Mate, that, I'd say, so you, that camera, it's got the same as the Pentax K1, <laughs> I think, doesn't it, Tom? That's the, what, the 36 megapixel CMOS sensor? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Sony, the Sony sensor, exactly the same sensor. Mate, 36 megapixels, you can go enormous. You'd be surprised. Yeah. I've gone a lot of people think, you know, I need these pixels, I need these massive amount of pixels, I need this 60 megapixel Sony camera because I want to print <laughs> enormous. You don't need to, unless someone's actually looking five centimetres away from a canvas that you've blown up. 
Yeah. Let's and face it, your 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 an image gets appreciated from a from a meter or or five meter distance. Totally. These pixels you're never going to see. I, I, mm-hmm. I, people talk about that all the time, and I can't understand why. When you print, I mean, I've got beautiful sixty by ninety prints that I've used, you know, from a, from a ten megapixel camera. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And they're really? perfect. So. Yeah, yeah. And you don't even need to do that now with this new thing in uh, in camera raw, do you? Really, you can, yeah. Uh, yeah. You can you can boost your megapixels anyway by doing that. Yeah, that's true. There's a new software for that. I still haven't explored that. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah, I tried it. I tried it last what a couple couple of weeks ago, didn't I, Paul? And I was yeah, quite yeah. surprised that the result doesn't affect. Well, from what I could see, anyway, it doesn't seem to affect. IQ in any way, so it's good, mate. That you that you can you know, you've got a camera that you're comfortable with. You've had it for you know a few years now, and you can feel like you know technology's hit a point where is it going to change that much in photography? I mean, everyone's yeah, hurrying no. into mirrorless so much at the moment. Uh, is it worth it? Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced myself. No, no. more batteries and. You got to worry about the weather sealing a little more. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. My, my cameras, it's taking a licking and it keeps on ticking. And I, yeah, I respect that. Mm. I keep with it. Yep, for sure. I've Neither. never heard a bad person say anything about the D D810. No, no, not one person. That a few that a few issues with the eight hundred, didn't they originally? Yeah, I think the shutter had quite a few quite a, quite a few issues in the beginning. But yeah, the D eight ten is a beautiful camera. A lot of people are still saying now the D eight ten is better than the new mirrorless stuff. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, we like to talk about gear. Sorry, mate, but you know, there's, <laughs> always, there's always an audience out there that says, you know, there might be an eighteen year old kid out there saying, I want to shoot like Matt Jackish. What gear does he use? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> it's good to hear. Yeah, I don't think I've had that conversation before. So there, there it is. You just, yeah. you just need to tell them your settings now, and they'll be all set. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> auto, auto, auto settings. <laughs> <laughs> auto JPEG. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. HDR yeah. the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I did want to just uh, brushly quick. Uh, Quick over Brushley is quick over Brushley. Just wanted a, com- <laughs> a little conversation about filters. Filters. Uh, yeah, are you do you use filters? Are you a uh, filter man, or do you, do you exposure blend or? Uh, starting with filters, I'm getting away from filters. I've gotten away from filters. I used to polarize most of my shots, mm-hmm. um, and what I've found is it really sort of killed a sense of depth in your image. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I've totally gotten away from them. I try not to use them at all. Um, and not only that, but my uh, wide angle polarizer doesn't thread properly anymore. So it, like I, if, I need, if I know I'm gonna use it, I have to put it on the night before because it takes about 10 minutes <laughs> to thread. Um, and then you're stuck with it, yeah. Yeah, and then you're stuck with it. So um, I've really gotten away from filters. Uh, I, I don't think I've done a lot, uh, you know, a cloud streaking kind of shot for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I prefer just natural. Um, mm. I get exposure blends when it's required. Uh, you know, I, I try to get it all in one shot, but, and actually most of my shots are done in one, um, but mm-hmm. the odd time you, you need to sort of uh, restore some detail in, in some of the highlights or shadows. Um so I, yeah, I do that when I need to do it. It's yeah. interesting you t- talking about um, polarizing filters because I, I, I've advocated my work with polarizing f- for years now, and I've always told everybody ninety ninety percent of the time your polarizer should be on, you know. Yeah. And I, I've actually found the same recently too with the polarizers. It tends to cut through. That atmosphere too, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. it, it kind of does, sometimes yeah. that glare, I'm actually fine. I have to bring back into an image yes. later mm-hmm. on because that that at, that atmosphere that, that creates a depth and creates a certain situation the way it is. Sometimes the polarizers just cut through the whole lot and saturate and give everything just a huge boost of contrast. And Absolutely, which actually looks that, great. It looks great when you look at the back of the camera when you look at yeah. it. Now, yeah. Yeah. I think you're yeah. getting an improvement, but when you actually open the raw file on your computer, 
uh, that sense of depth is kind of gone and you really can bring it back. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, they're great. Obviously, if, you know, if, if you need them for, you know, you're, you're taking a picture of a waterfall and you want to <laughs> cut out, you know, certain details mm. in a waterfall or in a lake or, or whatever for reflections. But totally. yeah, I think it's just... Like- we don't use blue skies anyway, so we don't care about saturating <laughs> blue skies, do we? We like storms. I think yeah. it's just getting out of the habit of just putting them on full all the time. I think that's part of the mm. problem is you yeah. tend to put them on and you put it on full polarisation, whereas yeah. if you just if you just tweak it a little bit, you can cut out some of the reflections and, and still retain some of that, can't you, really? Yeah, yeah, I went through that phase as well, full polarised, um, but now I'm like you know, not even using it. Um, you know, even in some situations, water looks better without a polarizer. I find, uh, Mm. you do get, you know, you might get a little bit of hot spots. You might have to exposure blend a little bit, but, uh, I, I almost like that sense of texture that you, you regain without it. Yeah. Um, my friend up here in Vancouver, uh, Tristan Todd, I'm not sure if you follow him. Yeah. Yeah. Tristan. Yep. He's not a polarizer guy, uh, and he's got great green scenes. And, and I'm like, dude, this is fantastic. Like, what are you doing that I'm not? And um, he's not using a polarizer. So uh, that's he, that was one of the reasons why I backed away from it. And, and I'm really right. like, well, um, I got one of my favorite, probably my favorite shot is from the waterfall in Indonesia, which I overpolarized and I'm mad about that because I'm never going back there. And <laughs> mm. or that that sheen that the leaves have yeah. uh, still turned out good, but I, I, I wish I hadn't polarized it or at least maybe taken one of each shot. One mm-hmm. polarized, not polarized. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, th- I think, um, Adam Gibbs, his recent stuff, he, he does make a point about doing exactly what you just said about taking a shot with, with and without. Yeah. And, um, that's, that's he, Adam's really made me think about, uh, whether I use a polarizer or not, um, oh. I am using it less as well. His work um, is so good and so subtle and, and so great. Uh, yeah, his mm. style is is amazing. Yeah, yeah. You never you never shot with Adam because obviously you. I have shot with Adam. You, you have yeah 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 yeah. Uh, I've shot with, yeah. It's been a few years now, but I, uh, him and I used to shoot together quite a bit actually, and we uh, we've shot in the mountains here a few times. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, he's done very well with, uh, you know, ever since uh, that massive title he won on International Landscape, and now his vlogs are, you know, really good. He's really done well building himself up. I mean, uh, good for him. Yeah, for sure. Mm, yeah, definitely, yeah. So, obviously, you uh, you predominantly edit in Photoshop or you uh, and use Lightroom as cataloging, or do you...? Yeah, exactly. That's what I do. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I try to keep it simple. I, I haven't really gone into the, these new softwares. Um, mm. yeah, I'm not into it. I, it takes me long enough to learn something new and a new piece of software. I really am not a very patient person when it comes to that stuff. So <laughs> having to learn something all over again is such a daunting task for me. I just not into it. Um, I'm, I'm happy with what I've got so far with Photoshop and what, what I've learned and I find I often need to relearn because I, I go sometimes a few months without, without processing anything. And then you kind of lose that artistic edge a little bit. Uh, yeah. so I almost have, like, I, I have a lot of videos from like Enrico Facetti and Alex Morega. I find myself rewatching them sometimes just to remind myself of what options I have and yeah, stuff yeah. that I hadn't used in, in a long time. And, and, um, those are, they have great reference uh, materials for that kind of thing. Just sort of, Adding to your toolbox, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah using their te- the techniques to apply to your style. It's um. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, mean, something we've talked like, about quite a bit, eh? Yeah. yeah, you can use someone else's technique and still maintain your own style for sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's how we all learn, isn't it? Really, you know, you you know, you take knowledge from everywhere and you put it into whichever direction you want to go. Yeah, for sure. Or you try and play the guitar like Jimi Hendrix and that's just never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't really back up my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, go, go, Tom. Go for it, mate. Sorry. I was just going to talk about a little bit about prints and workshops and, you know, do you do, you do workshops? 
I have done one workshop um, and it was for Max Drive actually in Greenland. Um, that was quite an adventure. That was really dumping in, jumping into the deep end of workshops for sure. Mm. Um, I have some more in the works, but nothing officially announced yet. So I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, mm. I am planning on leading more. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So you obviously um, like moving forward, where do you see, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself doing more work photography as, as like a, I don't want to say work, but more of a business type of situation? Um, I'm never really going to uh, focus on turning it into a successful business. Uh, for me, it's actually kind of, I'm actually compartmentalizing um, my art from the money-making aspect of my life. I want to keep it yeah. both separate. That said, yeah. uh, that said, I will, I will explore um, offering workshops. I, I'd love to do a workshop here uh, in BC at the old growth forests. Um, there's, there's a lot of little pockets of really special forests here that, that I think it'd be fun to take people to uh, while they're still here because they are disappearing. Mm-hmm. Fast. Uh, building, yeah, yeah. building a tour like that, uh, the logistics of getting people into the mountains here are, are quite difficult because of the level of fitness required. Mm. Um, but I may look at maybe, you know, helicopter options or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I'm sort of, sort of turning that stuff over in my mind about how I'm going to, you know, get going with that. Uh, it's it's really hard to envision at this time with, with the way, uh, you know, travel is restricted. Mm. But you know, when we're back to a sense of normalcy, then, then I'm really going to start um, pursuing that. Excellent. Yeah. And I am looking at, you know, maybe uh, getting into the print world as well. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to engage a couple galleries here and see if they're interested. Uh, I'm not really interested in selling on my own, but mm. uh, you know, maybe going down that road as well. Um, and I've actually considered blogging. Um, oh, I do. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just like everybody else, right? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, join the club. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm looking at it. You know, I, I. It's when I really think about what it takes to to make a vlog. It's it's a lot of work, uh, and you're mm-hmm. carrying you know two or three more cameras, and uh, your your half your mind is now diverted from making the photography to making the vlog. Um, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I like the idea of it. I don't know if I'm really going to actually go through with it yet. Um, I might try a few experimental ones and then see where it goes. But oh yeah, hundred percent. Ask for me uh, to to really pull the trigger on that. Yeah. Mm. I see, how annoyed, can... see how annoyed you get by watching yourself walk back and forward past the camera three times to get the oh, shot. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> But yeah, I suppose you can, you know, kind of half press the trigger, really, can't you? You can, you could go out and vlog for a whole year, and not upload it, and just sort of really build up, like not only build up basic content, but you can, yeah, sort of home home your skills in silence, if you know what I mean, secretly. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's kind of my style. So where where do, where do you see yourself going in the future? Is there any any aspirations? Anything? Any places you want? I know we can't. Um, it's hard to sort of talk about that now. But is there anything you want to shoot? Want to do? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've got a bulletin board right up here with all the locations, even just locally that I still want to get to, and I filled up two and a half pages of stuff. Um, but internationally, um, Pakistan is very high on my list. I want to get there to the, to the wow. range to K2. Uh, I want to get back to Peru. Um, those two are highest on my list, uh, back to Patagonia. Um, I'd like to do some of the more of the remote hikes in that area. Uh, what else? Um, you know, maybe back to Iceland, um, Iceland obviously a very popular location, but there are areas in Iceland um, that are that you can go and still be alone. Uh, mm. Last time I was there, I explored an area called Hornstrandir, which is in the very northwest tip of Iceland, uh, in in the West Fjords. 
uh, you, the, you can basically only get there by boat. And so, you know, I was dropped off and, and, you know, backpacked through that area alone for five days. And it was just absolutely amazing. I hardly saw a single other person. Mm. So I, I'd like to have that experience again. I didn't get good conditions. So I, I'd like to go back and, and maybe, um, and, and see what happens if I get better light or something. And the, the sea cliffs out there are just astounding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, Otherwise, well, here in Canada, there's tons to see and, and tons of my list just locally here. Yeah, well, you certainly live in a, in a good place, <clears throat> definitely. I am very lucky, yeah. Yeah, well, I wish you all the best for that, mate. Um, it's been uh, great to have you on. Um, is there anything else, Paul or Matt, you want to talk about? No, just got uh, one. Yep, go Paul, sorry, mate. We'll just say that we'll pop all the links to everything we can down below and we'll include them in the show notes to the audio podcast as well as the YouTube video as well. Sure. How much time do we have? I wanted to show you guys something. Uh, we have yeah, go for it. seven go minutes. For it. Go ahead. Well, I can probably do that. Yeah, I wanted to give you guys a glimpse into, into the world of landscape photography in Canada. So this is my uh, camping pillow. Beautiful. That right there is a bear bear tooth mark. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can't. Yeah, it went. And there's another one right there. Nice. Um, no way. Yeah. So um, there's a bit of. A oh my god. I was Tell us the story. <laughs> Sorry. Tell us the story. <laughs> I was on a canoe trip with my dad and my brother uh, in the in the north of BC here. And uh, it was a week-long trip. On day three, uh, we were getting rained on. We arrived at our campsite, pouring rain. Uh, so we were drying out in this little cook shelter. Uh, I had my camping, my sleeping gear in a dry bag. And I put that by one of the tent pads. Uh, so while we were in the cook shelter, this black bear shows up. And uh, he starts gnawing on the dry bag. <laughs> Like, oh golly. And it's like 20 feet away. Um, and so we're trying to scare it away. Uh, we're like banging on the banging on the shelter and like clapping and waving and screaming, and the thing just does not care at all. <laughs> it's just oh not good. Um, so uh, full disclosure, what happened next, me, my dad, and my brother all remember differently. So I'm gonna give you my version of it. <laughs> um, so what happened next is I had a flashback a flashback to, to a book that I read uh, called Wolf Totem and it's a true story that takes place in Mongolia and in the story the character is riding a horse and gets surrounded by wolves and he's basically done for uh, but what he remembers and what he does is he, he knows that wild animals don't like the sound of metal on metal so what he does is he takes the stirrups from his horse and he charges them and bangs them together. And that was enough to scare the wolves apart and get through them and get away from them. And as I'm reading that book, I'm like, I'm going to need that one day. I'm going to need that bit of information, that metal on metal, <laughs> all animals does not mix. So here we are in this coke shelter with this bear gnawing on my sleeping gear. And I'm like, metal on metal, metal on metal. So I grab my pot and my lid and without really consulting my dad and my brother, I just ran up to the bear banging my pot in my lid <laughs> and just hoping that it would work. And I think my dad and my brother saw what I was doing. And so they ran up behind me to back me up. And so anyway, the bear left, dropped my bag and left. You've got balls, mate. <laughs> I didn't really think about it too much at the time, but I, I, in hindsight, I, I think I bluff charged that bear. Now, yeah. <laughs> When I talked, me and my dad and my brother, we didn't really debrief about it until actually years later. And, and I said, hey, what happened there? Like, how did, you know, did, did I tried to convey what, what I remembered happening? And they said, no, that never happened. So, you know, they, they just thought the bear left on its own accord. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I took the story away from you. I first. know, I wanted them to validate. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is my sleeping mattress. I don't know if you can oh, see yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see yeah, all yeah. the marks in it. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, he punctured the crap out of that mattress. That's a $400 mattress. Uh, oh, no. I needed four more days out of it. Uh, See, I, I thought out of it, uh, so. I, I thought you were going to say that you woke up in the morning, opened up your tent, and there was a bear right in front of you. So you just grabbed your pillow and stuck it in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as good as that. <laughs> <laughs> what a story. That's Canada, huh? Yeah, yeah. that's Canada. Yeah. Actually, what's funny is about half an hour later, we saw a different bear in the same campsite. It was a brown bear. Um, but that one was more scared of us. As soon as it saw us, it ran away. But, yeah, I didn't sleep much that night. No, I'm sure. Way. No, you wouldn't. No, no. I'm not, sure. I'm not really sure we could top that. <laughs> How are we going to top that? <laughs> bear story. I, I, had a like shark. Bear story. I had a shark swim underneath me. Wow! Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, but he just didn't see me, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. That was the end of that. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. I think everyone in Australia's had a shark swim on reef if they went for a swim. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> uh, mate, it was beautiful to have you on. Great to have this this yeah, chat right. with you. It was great to know a little bit more about you know you as a person in general and what makes you tick. And, yeah, thanks um, for giving me the time and shedding a little spotlight on me. That's really kind of you. No worries, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a blast talking to you, and uh, that bear story has just topped it off. Yeah, I hope I told it well. I haven't told that story in a while. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank All you, right. mate. Cheers, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. Take, it, take care, buddy. Bye-bye.